as much as I have tried to put this subject down and not do anything more with it, something keeps popping up almost daily to drag me back into it again. For instance, today, October 27th, 2015, someone posted this pic on my wall, and it's a picture of uh, the Denali range from Kashwitna Lake, available on Wikipedia under the page for Mount Foraker. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. The distance from these peaks is listed as 100 miles. The curvature of a 3,959 mile radius sphere is just under eight inches per mile squared and commonly accepted as the curvature of a spherical Earth. We simply plug in the numbers. 100 squared times eight divided by 12 equals 6,666.7. There is supposedly 6,666.7 feet of curvature between the point of this photograph and the mountain range in view. If there was over 6,500 feet of curvature between the photo's point of origin and the mountain range, then Mount Hunter would have roughly 7,000 feet visible and Denali would have roughly 13,000 feet visible. The curvature would make Mount Hunter appear roughly 53.5% the height of Denali. Creating straight lines from the horizon to the peak of each mountain, the measurements from smallest to largest show 141 pixels, 173 pixels, and 202 pixels. This shows Mount Hunter as exactly 70% and Mount Foraker as 85% the height of Denali. There is only one explanation for this discrepancy. Mount Hunter is actually 70% of the height of Denali, and there is no curvature. You can fact check all of these mathematical equations, heights and distances, measurements, and test them against any large mountain range you wish. The answer is always the same. There is no curvature. Somebody posted that on my wall today, got me thinking about it, and you know, I'm just going to think out loud here. But you know, on a ball, in addition to scaling problems, would not the very distant high mountain peaks have to be arching away from each other toward the left and right instead of appearing straight up and down? Seems to me this is a very good test. Distant mountains sitting on a ball would show all sorts of visual perspective issues from scale to angle problems. Yet any time I've ever seen a distant mountain range, it always looks like the mountain peaks are appropriately scaled and in a straight line going out as far as the eye can see. The fact that the horizon never drops below eye level is also problematic for believers in the globe. The higher up you go, the more you should have to drop your line of sight downward in order to see the horizon. But this is never the case, even at altitudes above 60 miles. And I've got a video here, a little animation that I did, uh, showing uh, like a hot air balloon going up over a very large ball or going up over a very large plane. And as it goes up over the plane, the horizon always stays the same. It stays at eye level. But if you were rising up over a ball, that would not be the case. The higher up you go, the more you should have to adjust your adjust your uh, eyesight, your eye line, downward. You have to tilt your head to look down toward the horizon as the ball uh, go, recedes away from you, underneath you. And I say in this animation, um, so then the question is, which illustration best fits what we always see? And really, I mean, you see that that's the case even to altitudes up to 160 miles in uh, some of these other videos I did here. I'm not going to play them here, but you can check them out for yourself. Uh, I've got, well, actually, I'll play this one. This one's short. In my blog series at uh, testingtheglobe.com, I've shown that the alleged curvature is not even detectable at 120,000 feet when people send up weather balloons with cameras not fitted with a fisheye lens. And by that I'm talking about there's some videos that I have on my website there and you can do videos yourself, uh, do some searches on YouTube for videos of people doing high altitude weather balloon tests where they're sending up weather balloons and if they have it fitted with a camera that doesn't use a fisheye lens, I mean that thing's going up to 120, 121, 127,000 feet and spinning in 360 degrees and showing the horizon flat as a pancake as opposed to the 
Red Bull video or, you know, typical NASA video, which is always, it seems like always shot with a fisheye lens. And that's easy to tell when they're using a fisheye lens. First of all, like in the Red Bull deal, when that dude gets out of the capsule and stands out and they cut to the camera outside looking at him, the curve of the earth is so ridiculous, the size of the planet would have to be less than that of the moon. And that dude would have to be jumping from like millions of miles away or at least hundreds of thousands of miles away. I mean, the curve is just insane. And whenever the camera tilts at certain angles, I mean, it goes from convex to flat to concave to flat to convex to, con you know, it's going all over. It's incredible morphing earth. That's what happens when you use a fisheye lens. And a lot of the cockpit footage that I've seen from like these Russian MIGs and stuff that people are sending me that, that get up there really high, um, same thing. In fact, you can look in one of the shots over the, the pilot's uh, shoulder there, the wing is all warped because of the curvature of the windshield. So yeah, I mean, we got to be careful with, with curved lenses or glass that we're looking through. And that's why, for me, I've basically had to just throw most of that stuff out because it's, it's inconclusive at best. Because you look at one, it says, oh, well, there's a curve. And you look at another, it says, well, no, there's not a curve. You know, same altitude. Okay, so, I mean, you've heard all the arguments with uh, regarding fisheye lens and all that stuff. So, I mean, yeah, visually, uh, I'm not convinced by anything I've seen so far because uh, it's either demonstrably uh, shot with a fisheye lens and grossly distorted showing concave and convex and flat. You know, it's all over the place. Or it's just showing flat as a pancake. And I'll play this video for you also. It's only five and a half minutes long uh, where I was discussing flat horizons at very high altitudes with uh, John from Perceptions Radio and uh, Mark from Strange World. Some people are out there, well, we should do a Kickstarter campaign to get you up on the next. I'm like, look, these things are blowing up. I don't, <laughs> I don't really want to go up on the next space. You know? uh, as much as I would love to get into space, it was my childhood dream um, until they stopped blowing up. It's not something I'm going to be too interested in. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you, I, I have seen footage. Uh, there was a German rocket that went up uh, a couple months ago. And it got up to, I, I believe it was about 75 miles, 73 miles, something like that. Yep. And it actually it got up to 161.6 miles high. Uh, I was incorrect when I did that broadcast. I went back and looked at the uh, articles that I was referring to and saw that they had gotten up to 161.6 miles. 161 miles high, folks. The camera's on it. It's spinning around, and it's flat, man. Uh, when you see, the problem is people are using all these fisheye lenses, um, and a fisheye lens is going to be pretty close to accurate whenever the subject or the, whatever you're looking at is across the center of the lens. But as soon as that camera tilts up or down, it's all warped out of whack, and you know you get concave, convex. You know the Earth is the incredible morphing blob. Um, <clears throat> So this particular thing, uh, a rocket, when the horizon went across center, it's flat at yeah. 73 freaking miles, 161 yeah. okay. miles. I mean, I've seen the weather balloon stuff uh, up to like 130,000 feet, mm -hmm. and I mean, that stuff's flat as a pancake. Um, and I saw another one that was uh, about 60 miles, if I remember, that was shot way back in the beginning with, with a V2 rocket. It was black and white footage, and the thing's going up there, and as it, th as it starts to tumble back down and the horizon goes across the center, it's flat. Black yep. and white footage, V2 rocket. Yep. So w at, at this point, I'm looking at this saying, of all the information that we have, barring NASA, the government, and the military, uh, of the or, and, and that goes for any government or military in, in the world, barring all that, the only information we have is from experiments like the ones I just talked about or civilians sending up weather balloons. And in every single case so far that I have seen, in fact, somebody just posted uh, on my Facebook page, you've probably seen it going around, teenager floats, uh, whatever, 30-pound uh, camera into space to capture curvature of the Earth. Right, right. Problem is, if you click on that video and watch it, as soon as that horizon goes across the center of the screen, <laughs> it's flat. So, I mean, all everybody in the beginning was like, oh, if you've ever flown on an airplane, you've seen the curvature. Bam! Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get above 40,000 feet civilian in planes. So ain't nobody seen the curvature. I would have said it myself. You know, if I've traveled the world many times. I would have said, yeah, sure, I've seen the curvature of the Earth. That's because my brain told me I did. But yep. now that I'm out there looking for it, 
anytime I've been up in the plane since April, I'm taking pictures out my window, bring it into the Photoshop, put a parallel bar across it. It's flat as a pancake. Bingo. Can, and can I say something to that real quick? Yeah. Um, even though it's my show, right? I have to ask. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. Can't. No, I'm a photographer, so I know exactly what you're speaking of. Um, and I show people when I shoot their picture, uh, especially with a 16 by 35 uh, wide lens, uh, how you can change the perspective and force it and do all crazy things with it. And like you said, you turn it and it gets all wonky. However, um, a lot of people believe, you know, they, they say seeing is believing, right? So in terms of going into space, um, there's a certain sense of weightlessness, right? Where we was told you go into space, you float, right? Well, I've seen the same phenomenon in water, right? Our own astronauts uh, float in water, right? Yep. Uh, falling from space. Well, you're falling because the gravity is bringing you back into Earth. Okay, well, I've also seen deep sea divers when they go beyond a certain point, the water just pulls them down really fast. So I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, seeing is believing. We don't know what's up there just by sending a camera, right? We don't know what... But cameras are, at, at best, they're inconclusive. That's what I mean, yeah. Because of the types of lenses and whatnot. Uh, but I will say, from what I have seen so far, um, anybody who thinks that they've seen the curvature of the Earth at anything below 70 miles, you're, you're on crack. Yeah. It's not there. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you, you're convincing yourself that it's there, but it's not. And, and that's proven by as soon as the camera, that, that the object goes across the center of the lens, man, it's flat. And that's showing it as true as, as that type of lens can show it. So my question would be then, okay, if we actually physically go up into some, in some kind of craft or whatever uh, with SpaceX or something, uh, NASA in the future, um, what type of windows are they going to have? There you go. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and what disclosure agreements are they going to have to sign? Right. And, and, and how high would they even be allowed to go up anyway? You know, right. are they going to go up 70 miles or are they just going to skim? You know, they're going to go, it, not that it would matter anyway, because if there's no curvature, like you said, if there's no curver, curvature with the weather balloons at 120, 130,000 feet, there's no curvature at 70 miles. Look, if there's no curvature at 70 miles, I, you're not going to see it at 100. You know, you're probably not going to see it at 200 it's because it's probably not there at all and to to your to your point jonathan yeah sometimes you can't it doesn't necessarily tell us what we tell us what we see but it does tell us what we don't see which is th th at this point and you know me I, I like a little bit of a curve or and a warp in my model i i haven't seen anything i haven't seen any curve even the slightest amount of curve so you know is it possible that the pure the pure flat earthers uh were, were right along along this thing's tabletop flat it's very possible. Oh, but putting NASA, the government, and military issues aside, people want to point back to Greek philosophers and mathematicians from the second century BC as evidence that the ancients, quote, knew the earth was spherical, end quote. But I've already shown that Eratosthenes' little stick and obelisk experiment, for example, proved nothing except how to calculate the curvature of a ball that has sticks in it. Now, that's some creative math skills for sure, but a moving sun over a stationary flat world would account for the exact same shadows that he observed. And uh, here are a couple of animations that I created early on uh, in this whole process when I was trying to figure stuff out. Uh, I created this one to show, okay, how does the sun, you know, only illuminate certain areas and, and not other areas by creating a point light in poser and limiting its uh the amount of light that it threw off and showed how you know you got night and day basically this this uh, animation here uh, depicts how night and day would look uh, just with the sun going around then of course i created this animation right here uh showing how the four seasons work on uh on the flat earth model and uh, you, if you haven't had a chance to watch that whole video, I, I suggest you check it out and just kind of watch it from beginning to end. It's 13 minutes long. It shows the entire year of 2015, starting from January 1, going to the end of December, and showing the path that the sun takes uh, and the moon and, um, you know, where it is in the wintertime in the northern hemisphere, what we call the northern hemisphere, uh, and where it is in, uh, in the southern compared to the southern hemisphere uh, during the various seasons. And what I found partic particularly intriguing about this is when I compared January with June, and sh I didn't do anything to the video. I didn't speed it up, slow it down, do anything to uh, uh, adjust it. And you can see that by looking at the um, the date and time markers. 
uh, you see the hours are ticking off the same. You know, the hours are in sync with each other. But in uh, June, the sun is on a much tighter circular path uh, closer to what we would call the North Pole. And in January, it's further out on a much wider circular path closer to what we call uh, the South Pole or the Antarctic region. And of course, in order for it to do that on a wider circle, it has to be going faster to maintain the same hour and minute pace that it's doing when it's on the inner uh, circuit. So, you know, again, this these models that I created here are to show according to the biblical model, the sun and moon are inside the dome and the earth is flat. So I was trying to depict that to see what that would look like. And if that's the case, then, you know, the the observations that Eratosthenes made where he's looking at, uh, I think it was uh, one obelisk in Syene and one in uh, Alexandria, I believe, whatever it was, they're two fairly, you know, there's a good distance between the two obelisk and at a certain time of the year a certain time of the day the shadow was known to be like straight down over one but cast a long one uh at the at, uh, a long shadow at the one further away well i mean if you assume that the sun is stationary and parked way far away shining on a ball then sure that would explain the shadows but if you take what the biblical model says that the earth is stationary and flat and it's the sun that's moving well then you get something like this see here's this little dot that's the that's the light source let me back it off again when the light source was directly over this obelisk the shadow was straight down but the same light shining on the obelisk that's further away is casting a long shadow and then as the sun moves closer to the other obelisk, you see the reverse is true. All of a sudden, the shadow is straight down here, and it casts a long one there. And uh, in this particular animation, I went ahead and zoomed out because I was also uh, illustrating how night and day would also look. Uh, again, th this is what gave me the original ID idea for the, um, the previous video by creating a point light and limiting its throw. So, all that said, there are still some convincing arguments for the globe, which have caused a few to wonder and ask me on Facebook why Yahuwah would then make us think we are on a ball if we're really on a circle. Well, I would argue he didn't. He's telling us over and over again that we are not on a globe, but rather that we are on an enclosed circular plane under a dome upon which he is sitting, lovingly looking down on us. He's not the one deceiving us in this scenario. Uh, again, assuming that the earth is indeed circular and flat and set on pillars under a dome, then it is Lucifer and his monkey man scientists and other cronies who are the ones that are lying to us. As for those other seemingly convincing arguments, it may just be that we haven't thought outside the box, or ball as the case may be, enough to realize there may be other ways of looking at those things. I don't know. Much of that stuff is above my IQ, which last time I checked was 123, and beyond my skill sets to figure out. But for the sake of learning, I think it is important to keep an open mind and test by experiment as a zetetic explorer rather than by theory. I mean, we can theorize anything, but let's, let's use the inquiry method of science where we ask questions and go out and actually test it and observe it and see, you know, what happens. That's one of my biggest problems with evolution is it defies, totally defies the scientific method. There's nothing we can observe. There's nothing we can test. There's nothing we can repeat. Yeah, sure, there are minor variants within species, but you never see, you know, one thing beginning the process of changing into another and they say well of course not that takes millions of years well you can't prove that either by uh observation all you can do is theorize and you know come up with stuff based on assumption 